fellow Falcoholics, what is up? Welcome to another episode of the Dirty Birds and Brews podcast. I am your host, Kevin Knight at Falcoholic Kevin, here to bring you a single show this week. Uh, not going to have Falcoholic Live Wednesday night and won't have anything else later in the week because I will be traveling down to Atlanta, not for football, but for Dragon Con, which for those that aren't aware is a really fun, huge uh, sci-fi, fantasy, you know, pop culture convention like a comic con sort of thing for for those of you that aren't familiar with the area but uh it's a tradition that i've been uh going to dragon con uh for many years so i will be back i'll have lots of uh costume pictures for you guys on twitter if uh, so you know if you're if you're going uh, you can say hi if you know you know you can find me in the massive crowds but uh yeah excited for that but we got some some roster stuff to break down first so i couldn't get out of here without giving you guys something right um as the falcons did set their final 53 man roster they did not make any waiver claims. They We did see a signing and a cut from the roster today, but all in all, relatively quiet uh, and mostly intact roster. And honestly, some uh, pretty close to what I and others had predicted outside of a few sort of surprises that we're going to get to in this episode. Um, so yeah, we're going to go over some, some of my biggest takeaways basically from the roster, the moves today, uh, and just get you guys all set for week one, uh, where we'll be full steam ahead. Uh, you know, a little over a week from now, less than a week from now, we'll be in week one with real football coming uh, that weekend. So exciting stuff, guys. Uh, before we dive in, do want to bring you a quick word from our sponsor, betonline.ag, your number one source for all your betting needs. You can get the latest odds, lines, and match reports for baseball, boxing, golf, and more. Perhaps you're feeling overly confident in those Falcons futures. You can still bet on that before they, uh, you know, clobber the Panthers in week one, you know, hopefully, right? Uh, you can bet on Atlanta to win the NFC South right now. You can bet on the NFC Championship, on the Super Bowl if you're really uh, aggressive. But no matter what you decide to do, Bet Online is your sports intel headquarters this season as they've got you covered for all your insider sports wagering needs. Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to get your betting info, including live betting options and your favorite casino and card games you can play right from your home. So head to that website today or use your mobile device to, to get in on the action and be sure to use our promo code BELIEVE, that's B-L-E-A-V, to receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet online where the game starts. All right, so I put out last week uh, before the third preseason game one final 53-man prediction, and then I sort of... I was thinking, oh, if things really change, I'll do another show. They didn't really change meaningfully. I made one sort of... Uh, change to my prediction that didn't necessitate a whole new pod, um, which was that I swapped out Jalen Mayfield, who was one of the first cuts, un uh, unfortunately for him, uh, for Kyle Hinton. Um, but other than that, I sort of just was like, okay, I'll stand on whatever I had before. That's fine. Um, and ended up being pretty close to that. I think I missed on three things and we'll, and we'll get to those. So I'll just sort of break down um, really my my takeaways from this roster. Some, some quick notes here. Um, to start off, uh, one of the biggest questions was, did Logan Woodside do enough to be the quarterback three? Would the Falcons keep three quarterbacks because of this new rule or just because they are worried that Woodside could get poached off the squad? Uh, and that is the case. They do keep Logan Woodside as the QB three on the roster. He does make it. We'll see if that's something that lasts for the whole season or if it's more of a procedural thing for now. Um, but we know they have a lot of trust in Logan Woodside. I thought he did a pretty good job of shepherding the offense in the preseason, especially that first game. Um, again, again, you know, he's out there with, with a lot of backups, sometimes very, very deep backups that almost ended up ended in him getting uh, potentially seriously hurt at the end of that Steelers game where his hand, his throwing arm got hit while he was throwing. It looked pretty bad at the time, but apparently he is okay. He avoided IR. He went back in the game. Smith said that he was healthy and he wouldn't have gone back out there if he wasn't. So thankfully Logan Woodside's okay. He survived, uh, a game behind the third and fourth string offensive line, which was very, very ugly. Uh, thankfully, he's okay, and he makes the roster, so good for him. That was one of my predictions that I had uh, over Aaron Freeman, so I got to make sure to twist the knife there uh, that I was I was right, Aaron, just when you listen to this, so you know. Uh, <laughs> but So that's an interesting one to start things off. Uh, the next one was what would they do at running back? Would they keep a fourth running back? Would Cordero Patterson be ready to play week one? What was sort of the you know, what would sort of go on there and what I ended up predicting ended up happening, which is that Cordero Patterson probably healthy enough to play week one, hopefully, uh, and Godwin Iguabuike, who was definitely the mo most impressive of the two uh, 
sort of additions at running back this off season. Uh, he's headed to the practice squad officially. He's, he was signed to the practice squad today. So the Falcons are only carrying three running back, th- three running backs plus Keith Smith on the roster. And yeah, so Igwebuike makes it good for him on the practice squad. I suspect that he could be someone who's elevated. So for instance, if Cordell Patterson's not uh, available for week one, we could see Igwebuike, you know, as a practice squad elevation for a few weeks. Um, but like I said, I don't think there's too much worry about running backs getting claimed on waivers. Again, there were only like 22 waiver claims in the entire NFL. Falcons didn't make any. So um it was pretty safe to get him on the squad and hopefully he'll, he'll be there until the Falcons need him. Um, and he'll, and you know, at some point he probably will get an opportunity, whether that's as a return specialist on special teams or as an, as a running back in the rotation. I, I like it with and I, I think that he hopefully will have uh, some contributions this year for the Falcons. I, I thought he really showed some good stuff in the, in the preseason. Um, we did also see Josh Ali make it the roster as the wide receiver five, which I think everyone had sort of started to warm up to, um, after the second and third preseason games. And again, I think this was pretty close between Josh Ali, Zay Malone. Um, apparently Matthew Sexton came on strong late because he ended up making the practice squad alongside Zay, alongside Zay Malone. Um, so it seemed like those three were the ones that were at, were really strongly competing. Sexton was a late addition after he was waived by somebody else during camp. So it seems like they actually really like him. He, he has some return ability as well. Obviously, Zay Malone. I believe still the leading receiver in the preseason for the Falcons. Um, But Josh Ali has that chemistry with Ritter. He plays special teams. He's that sort of jack of all trades guy that can line up outside, line up in the slot, whatever they need. Um, And I think that, you know, really the chemistry with Ritter, I think is the important thing. Like if he needs to come on the field, if he has that connection with Ritter, I think that will be beneficial if he does have to play. Um, The big, one of the big surprises uh, comes at tight end where John Fitzpatrick, I did predict, him to make the roster, but I didn't think that he would make the roster as the fourth tight end over Parker Hesse, who was wa- uh, was waived as well. And Parker Hesse does end up on the practice squad alongside Tucker Fisk, the other uh, tight end that they had in camp. So Fitzpatrick ends up actually being the fourth tight end, um, which is surprising given how integral Parker Hesse seems to be to a lot of stuff they were doing. My guess is that they think Michael Pruitt can probably do that for them. Um, and Michael Pruitt offers more as a receiver, obviously. They also have Jonu Smith, who maybe can do a little bit of that for them as well, even though he's mostly a receiver. And then John Fitzpatrick, I think, showed more as a receiver uh, in camp in preseason than Parker Hesse did. And I think his blocking is still a work in progress, but he's got that size. I think he's got higher end receiving ability. And that's probably why they ended up keeping him over Hesse, who again could be a practice squad elevation if they need an extra tight end out there. Um, one of the interesting things was just three offensive tackles on this roster. Um, and that is still the case, although some some things have changed um, since Tuesday. So today we saw the Falcons sign tackle Isaiah Prince, uh, who was formerly of the Bengals, Broncos. Or maybe it wasn't the Bengals. I can't even remember it. Dolphins, Bengals, Broncos, I think. Um, he was drafted by the Dolphins in the sixth round back in 2019. Uh, last, I think it was 2021 was the last time he played significant games. I believe he started four games um, for the Bengals uh, in 2021, where he graded out really well as a run blocker, below average pass blocker, um, about an average overall PFF grade and like 300, 400 snaps. Um, so the hope is, you know, with another season under his belt, I think he spent all of 20. 20- 22 on the Denver Broncos practice squad. Um, he does have some experience. I think he's played in 19 games. I think he has six starts under his belt. So he's he's got experience. Uh, definitely a traits, traitsy player, right? I think he's like 6'7", 3'10", uh, 7'6", 3", RAS. So good athlete as well. Um, got that. I think he's got 35 and a half inch arms. So tremendous length as well. Definitely seems to fit the mold of guys that the Falcons like. Um, so it seems like they view him maybe as a higher upside or a higher level backup uh, swing tackle type of guy compared to Josh Miles, who was waived. And we obviously expect Josh Miles to end up back in the practice squad. The Falcons have two open practice squad spots at the moment. I suspect Josh Miles will be one of them. Um, On the other side of the coin, the Falcons actually end up keeping six interior offensive linemen, which I thought was a little interesting. I suppose Kyle Hinton maybe has some ability to play tackle two in a pinch. Um, Obviously, Bergeron does. 
uh, have some ability to play tackle in a pinch because of, you know, he played tackle all through his college career. So maybe they feel like in an emergency situation, Bergeron could be an extra tackle when they have to sort of shuffle some stuff around. Um, they also keep Ryan Newsel, which was not a surprise. I think he was the the top into the top backup probably overall on the roster. Kyle Hinton again was a guy I swapped for Jalen Mayfield, who ends up getting waived. Um, don't celebrate guys getting waived. It's, it's not cool. I know people, you know, were were not happy with Jalen Mayfield's on field performance, but very nice guy. I think he was kind of done dirty, de- uh, done dirty here. I hope he gets another shot somewhere else. I hope he develops. Uh, but um, you know. That 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 Steelers game definitely sealed things for him. It was it was not pretty. So, um, but yeah. It also, in addition to Kyle Hinton and Ryan Newsel, we see rookie Jovan Gwynn make the roster, um, which is interesting to me that they would go with him over a veteran uh, claim or anything else. But we know that they really like Gwynn. They've been playing him a lot at center, so they go that route, um, which is interesting. But we'll see. Um. Not really anything much to touch on at the edge group. Uh, Kamoko Ture ends up on the practice squad, which is the guy I thought would be there because of the, you know they just seem to really like Ture. Um, so good for him. Um, he's he's reliable, proven NFL rotational sort of edge player. Um, on the interior, we do see uh, some interesting stuff for sure, which is that Timmy Horn ends up getting waived and put on the practice squad. I think a lot of people just, I mean, he's like one of the only nose tackles they had him and Carlos Davis and, and veteran Justin Ellis, Timmy Horn seemed to have outplayed both of those guys pretty handily. It seemed like, Oh, he's going to be the nose tackle. They don't really keep a pure nose tackle at all on the roster. They go with, uh, obviously the top guys on Yamada, by the way, David on Yamada is probably going to be your nose tackle in those situations. He played nose tackle quite a bit in New Orleans, more of that one tech, like shade nose type of guy. Not, I don't know that they're going to be asking him to do like, you know, two gapping stuff, but, um, so they keep Joe Gaziano, the Gaz, uh, my guy happy. They kept him around. I think he's good. Um, you know, he played a lot in the Steelers game and looked like he was way better than all the backups. So that's what you're hoping for. I think he's definitely someone who could be active and be a part of the rotation because he could play all over the place. He could play outside. He could play inside wherever. They also keep Albert Huggins who came on really strong as sort of a late camp addition or mid camp addition. Um, after he was, you know, let go elsewhere. Uh, he came on really strong, played well in the preseason, ends up winning a spot on the 53. He's another guy that can sort of play up and down wherever they need him. Has some, familiarity with this coaching staff as well so those two guys Gaziano and Huggins make it over Timmy Horn uh, who ends up on the practice squad I believe um LaCale London is the other guy who ends up on the practice squad too we do see uh Tay Davis and Nate Lamman as the two depth linebackers and just four linebackers kept again that's sort of what I thought they would do Andre Smith Jr. ends up on the practice squad as the uh depth like depth linebacker and I think that that group is okay I'd probably like to see a veteran brought in over Tay Davis just because I feel a little bit nervous about D- Davis actually playing on defense. But, um, you know, we'll see. We'll see if they can have anything materialized there. Um, not really too much to touch on in regards to the safety room, in regards to the cornerback room. We'll be sort of waiting to see sort of do they put Jeff Okuda on IR um, now that, you know, we're, we're get, like, you know, when they get to week one, do they put Jeff Okuda on IR? Uh, what's Mike Hughes' status? You know, the, but otherwise, I think the six cornerbacks they kept were sort of the six that we all thought with, you know, AJ Terrell, Okuda, D. Alford as a slot starter, Mike Hughes, Trey Flowers, and Clark Phillips the third. All of those guys make it. Then we get two safety, or again, not really any surprises. The four guys I thought would make it, right? With Jesse Bates, Richie Grant, Jalen Hawkins, and DeMarco Helms, star of the preseason. Um, with regards to those groups, uh, we do see some interesting guys brought back. Uh, Natrone Brooks, the UDFA defensive back, safety corner sort of hybrid guy. Um, he makes it. He was pretty impressive this preseason. Um, I know he got mossed by George Pickens, but I mean, this is a UDFA corner going up against George Pickens. Uh, and I, I thought he actually played it really well. He just got beat. So I think he's definitely someone to, to keep around and see what he can do. And then Micah Abernathy at safety, they bring back on the squad as a guy that can sort of do a little bit of everything in the secondary. He's a good special teams player too. Um, so yeah, the, in terms of other guys on the squad that I haven't covered yet, um, they did bring in Tyler Vrabel, uh, Barry Wesley, both those guys brought back on the practice squad and then guard Justin Schaefer also back on the squad. 
Um, and they only have 14 guys. So we will see some more practice squad additions. Probably one of those is going to be Josh Miles. I sort of have him written in pencil right now. And then um, we'll see, you know, in terms of what else they do. Do they shuffle any more guys around? Um, but, you know, if they do want to sign veterans or other guys like that, they could obviously do that at any time. Um, so we'll see sort of how that develops over the next couple of days, how that evolves. And basically just look to see if is this the final roster or not. Um, you know, in terms of overall thoughts, not again, not much has changed since like the last roster projection. So I sort of feel the same way I do about it. I think the depth is a lot better here at most spots than it was in years prior. Um, I think we've got some really nice defensive line depth uh, for the first time in what seems like forever, which is really nice. Um, I think we've got pretty good depth at quarterback behind Ritter, right? I like Taylor Heineke. I think he's one of the best backups in the NFL. That running back room looks really good with those top three guys. You know, receiver, again, a a little bit sketchy, but given that Kyle Pitts is probably going to be the receiver too, and they, you know, I think Matt Collins is probably perfectly capable wide receiver three. I think that's totally fine. Um, you know, we'll see. It's it's more about I think Ritter than it is about the weapons. I think there, if you look up and down the the weapons, there's no shortage of, of receiving targets for Ritter here. I think they have not necessarily high ceiling guys outside of London, outside of Bijan, outside of Kyle Pitts, which is three high ceiling guys. That's honestly plenty. But you know, the other guys I think are all capable, all good options but not necessarily like needle movers and that's just something that they're going to have to deal with and probably going to be something that they continue to to target free agency in the draft like I would be shocked if we're not seeing like a a day two at least wide receiver edition next year um but I think you know they've they've got a strong tight end room I Kyle Pitts Johnny Smith Michael Pruitt really good top three Michael Pruitt and, and Ritter had a strong connection last year and Pruitt's a really good blocker so I think he maybe is someone who has sort of taken over Parker Hesse's role um we'll see i mean i think the offensive line depth is still kind of scary i i think ryan noozle's fine on the interior but like isaiah prince i i don't know if i trust him but the, the truth is like unless you're going to go out and sign a big money veteran to be your swing tackle uh you're probably not going to get a whole lot better than isaiah prince um but I, again like this is a guy that's been developing for several years i think he was about an average starter about 400 snaps for the bengals uh a cup like a couple seasons ago so hopefully he's continued to develop. He's a really good run blocker, so he will they will still have that. Um, but you know, we're we're just gonna have to to hope for the best there. Um, but yeah, like I said, I think the defensive line depth is so much better this year. I think they've got six guys on the edge that are all capable players. I think they've got five interior defensive linemen that are all pretty capable players, and the starters too, like I mean, it's just so much better. Like Grady Jarrett, David Onyemata, like just I mean, so much better than th- th- that that duo is gonna be really good for this team. We've got Ta- Taquan Graham. We've got Albert Huggins and, and Joe Gaziano, the Gaz, uh, as a really strong rotation. Um, they've just got a lot of guys that can all do it this year, and I, I think that'll that'll help this team a lot. Um, you know, linebacker. I, I think Troy Anderson and Caden Ellis are going to be a good pairing. You know, it's going to take some time for for this unit to gel. But like everyone, remember, like before we get into Week One, I just want to remind everyone, like this is a new scheme with a lot of personnel working together for the first time. So if the defense doesn't immediately come together, don't be surprised. Like, I think it's going to take some time for it to really gel. I think, you know, week four, week five, we could see the defense hopefully start to hit its stride and and play better. The hope is, I think, that the offense, which has been together now for several years, there's there's some chemistry there. Ritter has been the unquestioned starter all offseason. Hopefully the offense can, can take off right away and that can sort of cover up any deficiencies by the defense early on as they sort of get their stuff together. But I do think the defensive talent is a lot better. I think that we'll see hopefully some more turnovers, some more splash plays that will sort of overcome some of those early issues. But, you know, the Falcons thankfully don't necessarily face like a murderer's row to start. I mean, Carolina could be disastrous week one. Um, You know, they still have a lot of offensive line injuries. Austin Corbett remained on the PUP. So he's, he's still going to be out. Um, they have a lot of wide receiver injuries. You know, DJ shark is claiming he's going to be back from his hamstring in week one, but like, I mean, are you really trying to rush him back from a hamstring injury? I just, I would be very terrified if I was a Panthers fan, um, of that eventuality. So, you know, the Falcons aren't exactly perfectly healthy either, but you know, it is, it is what it is. Um, 
I do think that this is a good roster. I think it's better than it's been in years past. I like the look of it from top to bottom. I think it's going to be a lot better than it was last year. And, I, and I'm excited to see how this group, uh, how this group turns out. You know, I, I, I think that uh, we have, we have a lot to look forward to this year. We should have a better team, but now they just have to do it. Like, I think they've got the personnel now. Now we have to see this actually translate into W's, into wins on a weekly basis. And let's, let's start that off by clobbering the Carolina Panthers week one, or at least if, if, if you have to scrape out a week one win, that's fine. Just win the damn game, <laughs> please. Can we get a winning record? Can we win our first season opener since 2017? Can we do something, please, um, to get this off uh, on the right foot? Like, I, I would I would really appreciate that, Falcons. If we could just break out of this season opening rut that we've been in. They got close last year. They blew it, but they were looking good in week one last year. So hopefully this year we can do it. Um but guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, like I said, no more shows this week. No Falcoholic Live Wednesday night. I'm going to be putting this up on Wednesday. So if you're listening to this now, you're not, not going to be a show tonight. Not going to be any more shows this week. But we'll be back, uh, I believe, with three shows in week one. We'll have Wednesday night live. We'll have a game preview on Friday. And then, of course, the live post game following week one's tilt with the Panthers, which hopefully will be a big dub. So... Thank you guys so much. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed the show on YouTube. Leave us that five-star review on your podcast platform of choice. Join the community Discord server uh, before the season gets started. Lots of great chat. Lots of great stuff going on there. Uh, if you'd like to support us on Patreon, we really appreciate that. It's patreon.com slash falcoholiclive uh, to get some exclusive perks, to get access to exclusive Q&A sessions, which I know we're late on that. We're going to have one probably week one for you guys. So keep keep your, your ears open for that. Um, and yeah, I uh, really appreciate everyone. I'm Kevin. I have alcoholic Kevin. You could go to thefalcoholic.com for all that tremendous written content that'll still be coming out, obviously, all week. Uh, yeah, just excited to, to get to the regular season with you guys. We are we are tantalizingly close now. Um, and make sure if you're coming to DragonCon, say hi, all right? Um, we'll see you guys next week for week one. We are there. We've made it, okay? We've made it. So uh, until next time, guys, thank you so much for watching the Dirty Birds and Brews podcast. Today's show is brought to you by Bet Online. We'll talk to you next time, folks. Have a great week.